Vi kommer att prata lite om utmaningar och möjligheter i skolan som kretsar just kring flerspråkighet. Och eh, som ni säkert då förstår så pratar ni inte alla i panelen svenska så jag kommer att skifta language to English. And I hope that everybody is okay with that in this room. So first of all, welcome Jim. Thank you. you can can um, be here. So you're nice on the picture. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, Jim has been a great inspiration for us at Studi because uh, of his um, research and for those who haven't read this book, uh, it's available in Swedish, uh, it's, uh, it's a great read. It, it's, a, it's a good, uh, uh, very varied uh, subject to dive into this. So, to get to know you a little bit better, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your research? Okay, great. Well, um, let me first thank you for the uh, invitation to be here and, uh, and also thank you and, and Linus for the opportunity to find out more about Studi. Uh, Linus and I met uh, about a year ago in, um, uh, in Toronto and uh, when I saw what he was showing, I just couldn't believe that this was happening because uh, the work that I, I've done and colleagues have done has primarily looked at um, how, how students from immigrant backgrounds uh, learn the school language, how long it takes them to catch up, what kinds of instruction uh, is uh, likely to be effective in helping them catch up uh, faster, uh, what's the role of students' first language in the learning of the second language, and uh, what uh, has been developed uh, at Studi, I think, addresses all of those questions in, a, in, I think, a really powerful way, or potentially powerful way, if it can be implemented effectively uh, in schools. But my personal background uh, is not Canadian. I work in Canada. I've been in Canada for uh, more than 40 years. And uh, uh, some of the phonemes uh, that you find are here bouncing off the walls originated in Canada, but probably most of them originated in Ireland, where I grew up. I grew up in Dublin, and um, uh, I went to school and university there. I went to Canada to do graduate work. I did a uh, PhD in Edmonton, which is the most northerly of the big Canadian cities. I spent five frozen years of my life there. <laughs> I experienced for the first time uh, minus 40 degrees and uh, survived. Um, I went back to Ireland for two years, then went back to Canada. So the research that I've done and the, the context that I've worked in uh, have uh, been both North American and European for the, uh, for the most part. Um, and so the, the, the work that I've, I've done and, and what I've written about what's in, in uh, uh, this book is um, basically looking at what schools can do to help all students succeed. Yeah, so um, when the language project started, many of, some of you have been uh, with us from the start, it was a reaction to the crisis in Syria. And uh, it has grown to something else. Anna, you talked about it, uh, about helping uh, all students uh, to have equal opportunities and reach their potential. But this doesn't really seem to work because what we've seen over the last uh, years in Sweden is that the school system has actually become less equal. Uh, the gap is growing between high-performing and low-performing students. Uh, so despite all these good intentions, obviously this hasn't turned out so well. So what are we doing wrong here in Sweden? Well, I, I'm not sure what you're doing wrong in, in Sweden or what are, all countries uh, are doing wrong. There are blind spots in every country. But just to, to uh, go back to the point about uh, study being uh, suitable for everybody and all students can use it, one of the things that uh, I've been using it for on a, on a very kind of uh, part-time uh, basis is to make up for the gaps in my knowledge of science. Because I went to a school in Ireland uh, that was run by a Catholic order called the Jesuits who have their own very peculiar uh, ideas about education. At the time when I was going to school there in the 50s and 60s, uh, if you're in the top stream or the top class, you didn't have a choice about what you did in, in secondary school in terms of uh, uh, subject. You had to take Latin and you had to take classical Greek. So I had, I think, four years of classical Greek and six years of Latin. I didn't take any science course at all in my, um, uh, in my schooling, and that might undermine my credibility uh, here. But uh, uh, when I've looked at the study um, uh, lessons, um, they have been tremendously helpful for me in filling the multiple gaps that I have in, in terms of, of science. But in term, going back to what's um, uh, happening in, in Sweden and 
uh, the, um, the issues that uh, are here. One of the things I was able to do in, in writing this book, which is not a translation of something that I'd written before, it's a, it's a new book, it's not available uh, in English, uh, and, but I looked at all of the Swedish research that uh, I was able to look at that was written in English, and most of it uh, is published in one form or another uh, in English. I looked at the PISA studies. Uh, I'd been coming to Sweden, I think the first time was 1978, so I was familiar with uh, a number of things that were happening. And um, uh, when you look at the, uh, the Swedish context, one of the things that uh, emerges is the, the fact that it's only recently, relatively recently, uh, that uh, the uh, schools have implemented a widespread uh, system of Swedish as a second language uh, teachers. Um, and uh, it's, and the, the mindset in many schools is still that the Swedish as second language teachers will kind of take care of the problem of second language learners. Uh, and exactly the same has been the case in Canada, uh, where, which has had that infrastructure for quite a bit longer, uh, back to the late 60s and, and 70s. Uh, but there's still been the mindset that uh, second language learning is the, pro is the issue or the problem to be solved by the specialist language teacher. And at the secondary level, at the lower secondary or gymnasium level, uh, I may see myself as a mathematics teacher or a science teacher. Teaching language is not my job. Uh, and so that mindset is, is present in a lot of countries still. And when you look at what the research is saying, it's very clear that everybody uh, in the school is part of the language learning environment uh, for newcomer students. And if, it's, if the mindset is that it's only the Swedish as a second language teacher's job, uh, then the students are not going to get the support that they need. They need to get access to content. And so the, the content teachers need to know how to make content accessible and understandable to students. Uh, also, the content teachers need to be reinforcing the language of their content. So when you're teaching science, you're not just teaching scientific content it's expressed in language. Uh, and you've got to teach students how to write reports, how to read scientific uh, um, descriptions. Uh, same way with mathematics. Each content area has its own uh, language and specifics within that language. And so that needs to be reinforced by all teachers. And when we look at trajectories of catching up, um, uh, what we see is that uh, typically, and this is an overgeneralization, but this is the general pattern that Within a year or two, um, most students from immigrant backgrounds can function reasonably well in the uh, target language, uh, in everyday contexts. Um, but it takes a lot longer to catch up in terms of schoolwork and, and school language. And so academic language is very different from the language we use in, in everyday uh, situations. And so all children, Swedish native-born children whose first language is Swedish, are expanding their knowledge of Swedish academic language in school. There's a far greater range of vocabulary, there's um, low frequency words, there's grammatical constructions that we don't use in everyday conversation. And so the second language learners have to catch up to a moving target. They have to run faster. And they're not going to be able to do that uh, effectively unless all teachers are reinforcing academic language right across the curriculum. So I think one of the, the gaps that there may be in the Swedish context, as there still is in the Canadian context, uh, is ensuring that all teachers in their training, uh, in their teacher education courses, get access to the knowledge that's out there about second language learning among immigrant students, get access to the knowledge that we have about how the two languages connect to each other, and address misconceptions that might be happening. Because if we know that students are going to require support for five years and maybe even more than that as they catch up, um, then it means that this, the principal of the school, the head teacher of the school, needs to know about that information so that he or she can provide leadership. Uh, so that he or she can organize professional development for teachers. And um, so when we look at uh, the, the, the research that's out there, there are blind spots. We need leaders in schools who are knowledgeable about the, uh, what the research is saying. We need to, all teachers to have the knowledge in regard to uh, patterns of, um, of language learning, differences between academic language and conversational language, and how we reinforce, what are the strategies, the instructional strategies that we can use to reinforce um, academic language right across the curriculum. And uh, you write that in the book, you talk about that.
when a student come in with their uh, first language and start to develop their second language, this is not on the expense of uh, the first language. So um, reinforcing the first language actually helps. Yeah, one of the um, misconceptions that exist in uh, a lot of countries is that the first language is part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And what goes through a lot of teachers' heads is that, well, if only um, students didn't speak that language, then I wouldn't have this problem teaching them. Or if only the parents would stop te uh, speaking that language at home and switch to Swedish, then students' um, uh, Swedish would develop uh, much, uh, much faster. The research is really clear uh, on these issues. Uh, the first language is the foundation upon which we build uh, second language knowledge. Uh, when you look at uh, students who are um, developing both language in the school, if they're in a bilingual school, for example, um, uh, and literacy is being developed in both language, there's strong positive connections, correlations across languages, particularly as we get beyond the, uh, the very early grades of schooling. Uh, and so the stronger students' first language develops, the stronger the foundation there is for the school language to develop. And the research is absolutely clear on that point. So uh, we get a common question that, from teachers that's saying that, well, if, if the students use study uh, in their first language, then they won't develop their uh, speaking skills in Swedish. What, what do we need to say to them? <laughs> Tell them to use study and see what happens. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a common misconception. It's a misconception that a lot of policymakers, a lot of politicians have. Obviously, immigration is a uh, political issue. It's a controversial issue in many countries. Um, and uh, those misconceptions often get, uh, or those attitudes often get rationalized in terms of concerns about language learning. and. Um, so, for example, in the United States, where there are over 40 years, there's been a lot of controversy about bilingual education programs, mainly for Spanish speakers. Um, the attitude has been, well, these can't work because how can you spend 50% of the time through Spanish and, uh, and expect the students to develop as well in English? All the research shows that as we get up towards the later stages of primary or elementary school, uh, students not only catch up, uh, but forge ahead the best programs in terms of the performance of uh, Spanish speakers uh, in American schools are what they call dual language programs where both groups, or where both um, uh, languages are used to develop literacy. Uh, and often these programs now will have native English speakers as well as native Spanish speakers. And multiple large scale research studies uh, are showing that uh, students do far better in these programs than they do in English only programs. Uh, so it's the same with um, uh, uh, immigrant children who are in a Swedish language program or an English language program in, uh, in the Canadian context, uh, the better developed students' first language uh, is, the stronger progress they'll make in, in acquiring the school language. And um, if you provide content, provide support for students in their first language, uh, that allows them to learn content uh, at the same time as they're learning the school language, so they don't fall behind. If you don't do that, students are likely to be sitting in the classroom uh, for probably several years, not understanding much of what is going on, particularly if the mainstream classroom teacher does not have any background or has not had the opportunity to acquire instructional strategies that can help uh, support students' learning. And so the content is going over students' heads, uh, so they're not getting a lot of that. They're falling behind in terms of content, but also because they're not understanding the language um, and there's minimal support provided in the regular class for them to learn that language, uh, they're not advancing their academic language either. So if students can get the content uh, in their first language, that gives them concepts uh, to, uh, which makes it much easier to understand content uh, in the second language. And so what Studi has done is, is remarkable in terms of providing students with the option, with the choice of uh, getting the content, uh, mathematics or science or social studies, initially in their first language, a language which they understand. Uh, and then once they have that concept, they can move towards Swedish and see how the, uh, that con those ideas are expressed in Swedish. And they're like, because they've got the concept, they're uh, much more likely to understand the language uh, of that um, uh, of the content. And so, if, when you look at the challenge for immigrant students, uh, initially it's twofold. Uh, 
They don't understand the language and they don't understand the content. And so it's a double whammy, to use a colloquial expression. Um, but if we can provide them with understanding of the content, then that content will make the language much easier to understand. So for example, if, um, uh, if I start talking about baseball, which is not a, a game that's played uh, a lot uh, in Sweden, uh, and I'm using all kinds of terms and talking about strategies and stuff that you don't have any background in, uh, you probably are not going to get uh, as much of the information as I'm trying to communicate. But if, I, um, uh, if you have the background, if the background knowledge, then you're going to understand uh, what I say much, much greater. And so we can define learning not as, as um, just the uh, internalization of input, it's the integration of new information, new skills, new knowledge um, with the content, uh, the concept, skills, and knowledge that we already have. And so that integration is what defines learning. Um, and so when we provide students with the opportunity to get the knowledge, they're going to, in the first language, then that, when they move to the second language, it's going to be much more comprehensible, and they're also going to learn the, much more of the second language. So in a shorter way, you could say, like, that's nonsense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not your words. You said it. Isn't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you talk about this conversational language versus academic language, and we can, I mean, obviously when you read uh, the curriculums, uh, you've been involved in curriculum development programs, we can read in the textbooks. Is the language used there unnecessarily complex? Um, yeah, uh, you know, when you look at um, how textbooks are developed and who the target audience is for textbooks developed in any country, it's the generic student. And the generic student uh, in most countries is the student who speaks the, um, uh, the school language, the societal language, and who's learned it from the, uh, the beginning, from the time of their birth. They're not thinking about students who are newly arrived or students who uh, have spent a lot of their interactions uh, uh, learning through another language. So the textbooks typically don't provide the uh, support that students who are learning the second language uh, need. And textbooks also will have um, a lot of low frequency vocabulary. Um, some of that is the technical vocabulary of the subject. But there's also um, a lot of words that cut across different subject areas. Words like explain, analyze, information, uh, words like that that are not specific to any one subject area, but are part of the overall academic um, vocabulary that we, we encounter. And we don't use a lot of those words in everyday uh, conversation. So some increase in complexity is inevitable as we go up the grade levels and, and, in, um, uh, and in textbooks and in instruction. Uh, but I think sometimes the textbook writers uh, make the language more complex than it needs to be, and they're not thinking about clarity. And so I think um, when we look at what's involved in understanding any content, um, typically we explain the content and explain new words and uh, um, other information in more simple terms. In English it's very clear because the language of um, academic uh, content, the language of textbooks, in fact all books, uh, is primarily based on Latin and Greek. That happened in 1060s or started to happen in 1066 when the Normans invaded what's now England uh, from northern France and obviously they brought their language with them which was a variety of old French based on Latin. And the, the language that was in place in um, uh, Britain at that time was uh, a Germanic language. That, that's why there's so many cognates or connections with Northern European languages. But the two languages um, uh, kind of merged together over the next couple of hundred years to give us what we now call English. But they didn't merge evenly across all domains and functions. The, the, the high status language that the Normans brought in, which was the language of the ruling class, became the language of high status functions in the society. Law courts, uh, anything that was uh, written, uh, it was a language of religion, obviously already, because Latin was, was that language. Whereas the language of uh, everyday interaction remained primarily uh, Germanic in origin. And so when you look at, at uh, English, what we do when we explain something is often translate from Latin into Anglo-Saxon. Um, the, and uh, because we explain more difficult things in more everyday language. And um, so th uh, that's, um, 
uh, an issue that I think we need to be uh, aware of, that we need to explain uh, the content in very clearly initially, and then we can elaborate. Once the students have got the content, then, um, uh, and we explain it in using as simple words as, as we can, sometimes you can, you, the words are not there, you need to use technical vocabulary, but um, uh, you initially get the information across as simply as you can, and then you can talk about it some more, and you can expand vocabulary and, and reinforce uh, academic language. Um, you also talk about the connections uh, between identity and how schools could reflect the students that are coming there in a, in a more uh, effective way. Small things that yeah. could change the sense of being respected. Or yeah, it's um, you know when you look at. Uh, uh, school policies written in any country or look at um, uh, school curricula, uh, you very rarely find the term identity, or certainly not until quite recently. Um, and yet, when any of us think of our, about our own experience in school or in, in other organizations, identity is crucial. The, um, if we, for example, in our own experience, and this is true of me, if we thought that the teacher liked us, if we thought the teacher uh, thought we were bright, we, uh, that we could succeed, um, that gave us confidence that we could succeed and we worked much harder uh, for that teacher as opposed to another teacher that we knew didn't like us and so we tried to make ourselves invisible. And so when we look at, at students who are coming from immigrant backgrounds or refugee backgrounds uh, and um, look at you know, the ambivalence in the society about uh, this reality and uh, the fact that for some members of, of every society, you know, newcomers are not welcome. Um, there's, so, there's a sense that um, uh, my culture, my reality is not really accepted here. In order to succeed, I've got to become Swedish or Canadian as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, often that puts, that leaves students in the middle because they don't uh, continue to develop their first language uh, very strongly and they're not getting the support that they need in the school language to develop really strong skills to catch up there. And so part of what we need to do is to communicate to students that just because at this point in time they don't speak Swedish very, uh, very well or they don't speak the school language um, very well, that doesn't define who they are. They're not just this uh, inadequate or incompetent speaker of Swedish. And the danger when we talk about Swedish as a second language students is that we're defining students by what they lack. Um, and so in the academic world, and I know in Sweden this is the case, the term multilingual students is being used much more widely to talk about students because they're students who have had all kinds of experiences, uh, some highly traumatic in, 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 in a number of cases. They're students who have survived by their resilience or their family's resilience. They have knowledge of multiple languages in many cases. They have talents and skills that we need to find out about. And so uh, when we look at the role of identity uh, in schools, we're not just um, transmitting a curriculum, we're not just uh, trying to teach so the students will learn, we're also in a process of negotiating identities. Um, and so if we try to get to know our students well, if we try to understand the knowledge they're bringing in, if we show an interest in their language, if we open up the space so that they're uh, in the early stages or later stages, they are encouraged to use their first language for academic work, for example, for writing um, and uh, for doing research on the internet and in terms of contents, then we're communicating a message to students uh, that uh, their knowledge of other languages is, um, is a positive thing. It's valued in this school context. It's valued by me as a teacher. If we, for example, do simple things like, say, every day, uh, one student in the class brings in a word from his or her home language, and explains why they chose that word, what it means to them, um, and then everybody in the class, including the teacher, learns that word. It takes maybe five minutes of, of class time, but it sends a powerful symbolic message to students uh, about the value of what they're bringing in and the value of who they are. Uh, and so identity is crucial. Um, and so what we need to have in our minds is a, a, the, an orientation to teaching where we're not just transmitting a curriculum, but also building identities of competence and confidence among students. Um, and I think when we do that, a lot of really powerful things happen in the classroom. Okay, so now uh, Bengt, I think, have a question. 
I think you might have answered it already, but uh, sometimes we have a challenge when mm, no, no. Uh, sometimes we have a challenge when, when uh, pupils are somewhat weak in their own language, so that you have, for instance, people from Afghanistan that have been basically slave laborers in, in, in Iran. Uh, and they come over, so they, they are weak in their own language, they are quite weak in, in Farsi as well, and then they come here, they are weak and illiterate in Swedish, and then they get all three of them. Um, so with, with these techniques, and how will these techniques help them to, well, get, get well, say, proper pupils? Well, again, I think um, identity is crucial there, just because they haven't had the opportunity to develop uh, uh, literacy skills in their home language or maybe in the school language of their countries of origin doesn't mean that they're any less bright, doesn't mean that they're, they're not um, uh, uh, competent uh, individuals in all kinds of ways. By virtue of the fact that they got uh, to this country, it shows a lot about uh, resilience and, and, um, uh, and competence. And so um, the problem arises with students like that when we have a very rigid school system. When we have a school system where the curriculum is set by, by governments um, or municipalities and um, the teacher feels that she or he has to teach that curriculum in, in a rigid way. There's no way you can teach a, 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 a curriculum that was written for, say, 40-year-old native spe Swedish speakers who've had um, you know, 10 years, 9 or 10 years of, of instruction in Swedish uh, up to this point. There's no way you can teach that same curriculum to a student like you've described, who's missed out on a lot of schooling, uh, who's in the process of learning Swedish. And so we have to provide um, uh, flexibility uh, in the curriculum. I think it's not nearly as important that students get all of these facts in their heads uh, in the early stages as much as getting a sense that schooling is, is an environment uh, where they are welcome, where they can succeed, where the teachers that they're interacting with have confidence in their abilities and will create an environment where effort matters and where it's worthwhile to um, uh, to invest in schooling. And this becomes a, a crucial issue for the broader society. I remember, um, I think it was last year, um, uh, in the autumn around this time, I was in uh, Linköping and I was talking to um, uh, one of the teachers uh, there who was saying that you know, the principal in her school, which was a large, um, uh, had a large number of uh, immigrant background students, um, you know, keeps on saying that he has, once the student arrives in the school, he has three days to get that student engaged. Uh, if the student does not connect, if the student doesn't feel that uh, school is a place where uh, he can be himself and, and become uh, a, a, an active member of the society, if, if that connection isn't made, uh, then the student is going to drop out of school and probably get into uh, antisocial behavior with gangs. So the, the messages we give students are crucial, and the school itself has got to see itself as a welcoming place, where teachers are not only the teachers, they're also learners. They're learning from their students and learning from, from the communities. And um, uh, that's a much broader job description and mindset of who we are as educators than um, the more typical one where we're just transmitters of the curriculum. So uh, you're often described as a supporter of translanguaging, and we talked about that yesterday, and you said like translanguaging seemed to be a more commonly used term here than yeah. in Canada. Uh, what I've read about it is that it has some, some criticism regard the, regarding how it's supposed to be uh, used in classrooms. What are your experiences on, on that? Um, well, you know, thanks to a number of, of researchers in the Swedish context, uh, uh, Gudrun Svensson and um, uh, Osef Aden in, in Falun, um, the term translanguaging has become quite widely uh, used uh, in the Swedish context, and uh, most of the teachers that I've talked to over the last couple of years after this book has come out uh, are very familiar with that term. But it's, uh, I think there's a danger of jumping on a bandwagon and um, not really inquiring into what the term actually means. Uh, the term, the basic meaning of the, of the term, when we talk about it in an instructional way, is that we're opening up the space so that uh, students' first language, uh, first languages, can be used for learning purposes, uh, and students can become more aware of how language works um, uh, in general terms. And um, there's a, a hu huge amount of research 
showing the positive connections that exist between students' first languages and, uh, and the school language when both languages are, are encouraged to develop. Um, so if students have the opportunity or if they've already developed literacy in their first language, uh, then that's a foundation upon which we can build uh, Swedish uh, skills. And so if you let me give you a concrete example from one of the, or several of the projects that uh, I've been involved in. Um, this is a, a, a school that has a large number of students from um, diverse backgrounds, many of them from Pakistan. And the teacher was teaching in a grade seven classroom, so to 13 year olds. And all of the students in the class were uh, from uh, uh, immigrant uh, backgrounds. Some of them had been in Canada for about four years, five years, others had just arrived. But the teacher was uh, familiar with uh, English as a second language strategies. And so they were doing a unit uh, in social studies on immigration. And the, um, uh, it, it's typical in Canadian schools that at the end of a unit, students will do what they call a culminating activity or, or a project focusing on, on some of the things that they worked in uh, on the unit. And these three students from Pakistan um, asked the teacher if they could write a story uh, intended for younger children from the same background uh, about their own immigration experiences coming from rural Pakistan to high-rise uh, Toronto. And the teacher said, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and uh, they also suggested that we do it in two languages because um, uh, that way one of the students who had just arrived about a month previously um, uh, could participate also. And um, uh, and also the students that are being written for, many of whom were, all of whom were Urdu speakers, could understand it if it was in both languages. And so the teacher encouraged them to do that. And two of the students had been in Canada for about three and a half years, and their English was pretty fluent. The um, other student, Madiha, had been here for just, um, uh, been in Canada for just uh, about six weeks before they uh, started uh, working on this project. And so what they did was they discussed the story uh, initially in Urdu. Um, uh, Medi, who was a full participant uh, in that, because that was she was that was her language, um, and um, they invented a composite character called Sonia, and they, in terms of Sonia's story, they injected experiences that all three of them had had. They discussed what was going to be on each page in terms of text, in terms of illustrations, uh, and they. Um, and then they wrote after planning it in Urdu. They wrote the first draft in English and then discussed that with the teacher and she provided some feedback to them. And then when they finalized the English version, they went back uh, to Urdu and translated from that, that back, from English back into Urdu. And when you look at some of the videos we have, you hear the students talking about, um, about language itself. You know, how do you say that uh, in Urdu? No, that's not the right word. Um, uh, I've forgotten the word for that. I'll have to go, go home and ask my mom uh, how you say that uh, in Urdu. So that kind of awareness of language and talking about language and bringing the two languages together was going on. Um, and if you think about Medija, the student who had just arrived, and think about what she would have been able to do uh, in a, uh, in a typ typical Canadian classroom, that would be all in English, um, you might get two or three painful sentences out of her. Uh, in, a, in a writing project. Instead, she becomes a very proud author of a 20-page book that's beautifully written in two languages, beautifully illustrated, that's been read by thousands of people because it's up in the web. Um, and you've got a transformation, not just in terms of learning, but in terms of identity. Suddenly, she moves from an identity of being the ESL student, English as a second language student, who doesn't speak much English, and who can't show her competence in that language to being somebody who can hold this book up and say, I wrote this. And so you've got a, a huge amount of learning happening. If you were to give the story that she and her two friends wrote to Medea before she had written it, give, give her the English version, she would not have been able to read it. But after she had written it, she could read it. So it's, it's, um, it sounds paradoxical, but it, it, it's an example of what some people call, call performance precedes competence. And so that couldn't be done if we said, no, this is an English only zone. Uh, if you use your first language, that's going to hurt English. Exactly the opposite is the case, and we've seen that happen over and over again in many projects that have gone on in the Canadian context and that are happening in Sweden also. Wonderful story. <coughs> um, so how can multimodality tools, because that is also kind of a way of yeah. expressing your work in, in different ways.
uh, how can multimodality learning tools like Studio or, or uh, others support students in developing their academic language? Well, it, basically, when we look at uh, what's required uh, to support students in uh, in engaging in schooling and and uh, getting on the uh, right or accelerated trajectory in terms of uh, their academic language, there are several things that need to happen. First, one of them is what um, people in this area call scaffolding. Um, if you think about a scaffold for a building, it's what the um, workers will climb up on to get up to the roof and uh, do work that's high up. So scaffolding enables us to go further, to get, to get higher, to do things that we wouldn't be able to do without the supports. And so there's a whole range of instructional strategies that you could think of as the Swedish as a second language toolkit or the English as a second language toolkit that uh, enable students to understand content that they wouldn't have been able to understand before. So use of visuals is uh, uh, one primary thing. Graphic organizers, uh, Venn diagrams, timelines, all of those things help us to get the meaning with less reliance on the language. But also students' first language is a, can be a major tool in terms of enabling them to get access to the content. And what Studi has done, I think brilliantly, is to uh, allow students to choose which language that they will, will use to get content initially in their first language that's supported by animations, supported by clear language, so it's not highly complex uh, language like a lot of textbooks are. And so they get the content, uh, and then once they have the content, it's much easier to understand that content in a second language. Um, and so scaffolding is one thing that's very evident in, in study. Uh, connecting to students' lives uh, is, and so the curriculum is not just being transmitted in one size fits all, but we're tapping into students' prior knowledge. We're helping them to integrate the new information and concepts with what they already know. Uh, that's a, another crucial uh, element. Affirming identities is a crucial element. And when you look at uh, how Studi might uh, link in with that, you've got a situation where the fact that students' first languages are represented in this tool. Um, the fact that uh, they can learn through their first language and use that as a foundation for uh, getting into the content in Swedish and, and expanding their Swedish, that's saying something to them that the first language is recognized. That's an, an identity affirming uh, reality that they're seeing on the on the screen when they can listen to it uh, in their first language too. It's, it's challenging the mindset in, in a lot of schools that you, know, you leave your first language at the schoolhouse door, it's not, it doesn't belong here. That's uh, basically saying, well, you're welcome uh, in this school only to the extent uh, that you conform to the norms of the wider society and use only, only the school language. And that's very limiting in terms of what it allows students to do. And then the, the, the fourth thing that I think Studi uh, also does and possibly could do even more is reinforcing students' academic language across the curriculum. It's not just an issue for the um, uh, Swedish as a second language teacher, it's not just in that classroom time. As students are learning content, content they've got to also be learning the language. And that requires some specialized techniques from science teachers, math teachers, etc. And an awareness that they have a huge opportunity to um, reinforce students' knowledge of how academic language works, expand their vocabulary, uh, and accelerate that trajectory. And I think Studi does most of those things uh, uh, very well. We can probably be a lot better, uh, especially around like those common words that we, uh, we have the concepts, but we do need to yeah. uh, address that. Uh, I'm curious if there are any questions from the audience. Maria? Det är bra syn, så jag såg det. Det kan vara att den högtalare är runt ovanför. Försök att inte rikta dig mot högtalare. Vi, det är låt där framme, så vi kan inte ordna ljudet tyvärr. Det här kanske är bättre. Det är inte bättre, tack. Först det jag vill säga är att jag verkligen älskar din research. And I basically uh, based my own research on your results and uh, on your tradition. I hope it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, I also agree with uh, the prevalent uh, research on the importance of continued development of the students L1. And, uh, uh, but 
Uh, now I'm uh, leading a project on new arri arrivals in Sweden, and uh, the teacher I meet teachers teachers every day, and we have a quite uh, big challenge I would say because uh, uh, um, how do you, how do you do that in practice in the classroom when you have in Sweden you can have 16 uh, different uh, L1s and. Uh, how do you actually uh, manage to plan classroom activities uh, when you also uh, involve uh, the students uh, L1s? And uh, uh, yeah, uh, do you have a solution? It's going to cost you. Must film this. I would pay. <laughs> um, it, uh, clearly, there are major challenges when we have this kind of situation, particularly if you add to the fact that uh, students may have missed out on, on schooling. Um, uh, some students may have experienced really traumatic uh, uh, events uh, in their lives. So the challenge is, is immense in, in many contexts. And it's not surprising that teachers may feel overwhelmed. Um, but I go back to what I said earlier on. Uh, we need to inject flexibility into the, the structure of the school system. It's totally unrealistic to expect a teacher teaching a diverse class uh, like the one you described uh, in the same way as a teacher teaches a, a homogenous class full of Sw Swedish native speakers. That means modifying the curriculum. Uh, that means um, uh, uh, using tools that are going to be effective. And one of the problems with traditional textbooks is that they're static. Um, there's no accommodation to diversity in there. There's no kind of glossaries on the side in multiple languages. When you move to an, elect, an, elect, an electronic environment, uh, the possibilities and the affordances of that environment uh, open up dramatically. And so in an environment with um, uh, that study provides, um, which is not going to solve all the problems, obviously, but it's going to address at least some of them. Um, the, the fact that students can get content that's presented clearly uh, through animation that's uh, engaging through their first language, either orally or in written form or both, means that some of the translanguaging challenge has been taken uh, out of the, the situation. The teacher doesn't need to know the languages of, of the students, and that's obviously unrealistic to expect teachers to know those languages. Uh, but the study provides a, um, a foundation um, that al allows students to keep up with content um, so that they're not falling behind uh, as they're learning uh, uh, Swedish. Um, but the other aspects that uh, teachers can do is, uh, would involve things like, you know, depending on the age of the students, but if we're talking about older students, if we're looking at content um, that, that uh, is maybe available on the internet in students' own languages or in a language that they know, um, then encourage them to do some research, maybe working in, in pairs or groups from the same language background, to come up with, find out what um, uh, they can about the content in the, um, uh, in the internet, where they can read the content in their own language and then bring it back to present to the class uh, in Swedish. And so you're moving across uh, languages. Again, just one example of, uh, of this kind of thing happening was, uh, uh, a project that a teacher, she was in grade seven, I think, uh, in uh, a city near Toronto uh, did, uh, where it was back in 2008 and it was the American election where uh, Obama was running for the first time. And uh, the teacher encouraged uh, her students to look at what they could find in their own ethnic media, in newspapers written in Arabic or other languages, Chinese, uh, other languages that were represented in the class, to find out what um, they could in terms of the people's assessment uh, from those countries uh, about Obama. And, and if he becomes president, what kind of a president is he likely to be? So one of the students was from an Arabic background and he looked at what the Arabic media were saying about Obama, whether he was going to magically bring peace to the Middle East or what his policies might be there. So he, would, he did that research in his first language, then came back to the class and, and he wrote it up in English and then presented what he found to, uh, to the other students. So like, this is an example of translanguaging, where uh, the teacher is essentially just opening up the space, encouraging students to use the languages that they know uh, and also their prior knowledge. They can also talk to their parents about uh, these issues. 
And so there's, once teachers start brainstorming about possibilities, all kinds of, of things will bubble to the surface. Um, if we're looking at younger uh, students, uh, writing dual language books is something that uh, is becoming relatively common in, in quite a few Canadian schools because there are examples of, of how powerful this can be. There's a, a website uh, called the Dual Language Showcase um, that was developed by a teacher in a school near Toronto. It's been, it was developed in about 2002. And there's about 120 stories in different languages, in English and other languages uh, that students have written there. There's about 32 different languages involved. And these are, are students as young as grade one uh, who are involved in this project. And uh, so parents get involved in something like this. Um, and so if you, if you look at uh, examples that are happening and in, in the books that I mentioned that have been published in Sweden, there's all kinds of examples of, um, uh, of really powerful pedagogies happening with students in, uh, who are coming from diverse backgrounds. And so if we, if we talk about the issues, if we talk about possibilities, if we inject some flexibility into our curriculum and instruction, then I think um, uh, teachers won't feel nearly as, as overwhelmed as they sometimes do. Again, the challenges are not going to go away, uh, but they may be uh, lessened to some extent, and students may gain greater confidence uh, that they can succeed and that effort will make a difference. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions floating around? Does the microphone work now? Yes, yes it does. Okay, better. Jim, these are, you know, kind of quite, uh, these are the school leaders or the uh, Förvaltningschefer. What's that in English? <laughs> Somebody knows? No. Um, so, I mean, you control a lot of what's happening and, and provide the structures in, in the schools. So what would you say to them? Because those are the ones who make it happen. <laughs> okay. The... I think when you look at what can happen is there's, uh, there's some things that schools can't uh, do much about. And one of the characteristics of immigration in Sweden over the last 40 or so years has been a lot of segregation of immigrant communities from, um, from the mainstream in terms of kind of satellite cities that have been built up around major cities. Uh, that's problematic because uh, housing segregation leads to school segregation, leads to lack of contact with Swedish, uh, and there's not much you can do about that. So one of the things that I think we need to talk about is what we can do very easily, very cheaply, and that would be effective. And one of the things that is, has been neglected in a lot of contexts is uh, paying attention to the research on literacy engagement. By literacy engagement, I mean active engagement with reading uh, extensively and writing extensively. There's a huge amount of research from the ranging from uh, hundreds of thousands of students in the OECD's PISA studies, the Program for International Student Achievement, to many, many other studies, showing that uh, probably the most powerful predictor of how well students are going to learn to read uh, is the extent to which they get actively engaged with literacy from a very early stage. It's a more powerful predictor than soci socioeconomic status in itself. And so when we look at the fact that many of our immigrant communities are also living in socially disadvantaged uh, contexts, um, and students living in, in socially disadvantaged contexts, uh, often their parents don't have the money to buy books, they don't have money to buy iPads, they don't have money to bring their kids to museums. Um, and so there's, the research has shown very clearly that in lower socioeconomic uh, background communities, there's much less access to print uh, in students' homes, in the United States context, in their neighborhoods, and also in the schools that uh, students often go to. The school libraries are much well, less well stocked with books than schools in, in richer communities. And so if we wanted to make, a, I think, a big difference in terms of achievement of, of uh, students, talk about, within the school, how we can increase students' access to books uh, at the preschool level, make sure students are uh, exposed to books, uh, talking about books, listening to stories being read, dramatizing stories, because students from socially disadvantaged backgrounds are starting off with a five-year gap compared to middle-class kids. Uh, if, th if any of us think about our own kids and how 
Uh, we read them uh, on a regular basis. We bought them books for um, uh, birthdays. They were surrounded by books. So older siblings read books to younger siblings. A lot of that isn't happening in, in the homes of uh, kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And so they come to school without that literacy engagement uh, uh, already. And then the schools, if the schools don't immerse students uh, in a powerful, literacy-rich environment from the very beginning, uh, they're not going to succeed nearly as well. And just one statistic that I think is really telling, again, comes from the OECD. They found in one of the reports that they wrote um, uh, on engagement, they found that there was about a one-third overlap between the negative effects of low socioeconomic status and the positive effects of reading engagement. This is on you know, the achievement of 15-year-olds. Um, what this means is that we could potentially push back about one-third of the negative effects of social disadvantage if we were to get kids from low, lower socioeconomic backgrounds actively engaged with reading from a, a very early stage. So there's a causal connection there. And reading in the first language is equally important to reading in Swedish. So encouraging parents to get library cards, to get uh, books in multilingual books from public library, in our schools, seeing if we can build up a multilingual collection also. Because um, reading is reading. And uh, uh, the more st uh, students can get access to books in Swedish as well as their home languages, the better they're going to do. Thank and that, you. Th that doesn't cost a lot of money. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Our uh, 56 minutes is over. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, at Jakobita, uh, sorry, I'll change the Swedish. Just for a second. Sure. Uh, halv uh, sex. Är det ja, precis. Uh, halv sex är det på franska skolan. Då kommer Jim att göra en föreläsning eller en variation av en föreläsning som hölls på Pedagog Malmö i början av veckan. Uh, Titta på dig, det är konstigt. Uh, så kom gärna dit. Uh, jätteroligt. Uh, alltid ett sånt stort intresse. You will uh, also get... Uh, some goodies, some Swedish goodies. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.